Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm having uh, I have the huge pr uh, pleasure here of having a chat with uh, with a former colleague and uh, certainly an expert in the field of uh, digital learning, uh, online learning, distance education, and just learning in general. Uh, Dr. Marty Cleveland Innes, with uh, professor at uh, Athabasca University. Uh, Marty, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. One of the things that we uh, would love to get a bit of a sense on, there, there's a great degree of expertise in the field of digital learning that many faculty are now just becoming aware of because we're seeing this sudden rush to the online environment due to some global health concerns. But maybe if you can give us just a little bit of background uh, of, of your work and your research. Sure. So in, in just a minute, I'm going to tell you a story of how it is I ended up teaching online. But I, I, I want to start off by saying, that um, I'm, those of us who have worked in this field for a long time are here to offer support and ideas and suggestions um, to all of you who are now making um, a quick, set, quick exit from traditional in-person place-based delivery to moving over to the online environment for what is an unintended consequence of this um, pandemic that we're experiencing. It's a great opportunity for you to to take a look at what the technology has to offer you know under conditions where people are going to be very forgiving of how it's going to go but we can give you uh, the sort of you know top five hints of how to make this work and in fact in the long run can be significantly beneficial to you your your work life and to the outcomes for the students as well Great. Uh, thanks for that. Now, if you, if you were to look at uh, things, so let's picture the, the type of uh, individual that's taking this course, likely. They could be a uh, prof in a, uh, you know, in a university in Australia, or they could be out in Europe, or they could be in Canada or U.S. or, or any, any number of regions, uh, you know, Latin America, uh, or it could be in, you know, somewhere in South Africa or Senegal, and they're, they're facing now with this sudden impetus to move online. Right. Based on the research expertise that you have and on the work that you've done over the duration of your career, what would you like a new faculty member to know as they begin to move and pivot into this online environment? So the first thing I would say, um, George, to our, our new colleagues working in this environment is that this model of delivery is not a replication of what occurs in place-based and um, place-based in-person environments. Note that I am using the phrase in-person, not face-to-face, -face, because you can, in fact, as we are, as George and I at least are at the moment, we are face-to-face. -face. So there is, there are some things for you to consider as you move into this environment that include not just using the technology, but how it is you're going to engage with the material and the students. I wanna tell you, as I said earlier, just a very short story, only takes a minute, about how it is I ended up moving from in-person place-based teaching into mediated environments. I was a brand new PhD, was, uh, let's see, 24 years ago now, and I had finished, I walked, down the hallway one day and my supervisor said to me, we'd like you to teach the research methods course for the master's students. And I, I was bowing and scraping and saying, thank you so much. I'm thrilled that you think I'm worthy to teach such a course. And I'll start getting ready right away. I had, I don't know, about six weeks. Great, she said, talk to so-and-so about your contract and they'll give you the old syllabi, et cetera. So I'm madly getting ready, I'm so excited, I'm privileged. And about three and a half weeks later, she walked by me again and she said, by the way, did anyone tell you that this course is delivered by teleconference? And my response at that time was, what's that? What's that? So I had a little more time than some of you are going to have, but two and a half weeks to figure out what that was. You at least have, uh, you know, you know that it's out there, you know the language, we're all a little more tech savvy than we were at that time. I will tell you that it was um, 
when it was a watershed experience for me because I had to go into this teleconference environment and say to the students, I'm brand new at this. I can help you with research methods. That I have a lot of experience with. However, this is a new, this is an, a new delivery method for me. And you know what they said? Yeah, us too. This is new as well. So we had the opportunity to work together. Some of them will tell you that it was one of the best learning experiences they'd ever had. Why, why was that? Because we were able to work together as a community. Certainly, I had the responsibility and the requirement to offer the expertise in the content, but they were able to um, help me with the technology. Uh, they were able to work with each other to connect, to support it through the technology, but that led to a lot of peer interaction and a lot more uh, sort of presence on my part as a person rather than just being a content expert. Yeah, that's, so, yeah, that's that's terrific. So, so that experience, and I think it's individually, we're all repeating those kinds of stories, or many will be. And uh, I love the point that you emphasized the quality of the learning experience. I think at some level, uh, the moving online is not a lesser than classroom experience. It's a completely different experience than a classroom experience. There's certain things that can actually work better in this environment, but you need to respect what it is that's unique about it. So I think uh, one of the things I'm worried about is you're going to have a group of faculty that will say, you know what, I'll, uh, you know, I'll get Zoom and uh, I'll lecture at my students now, you know, online, on this computer screen for X number of, uh, of hours a day. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to that? <laughs> Well, there is something that we, uh, a phrase we've been using in our field and we've done extensive research on, it's called the flipped classroom. And that means that what you do is give the students the reading. You can even do a video of yourself, which you should be able to learn about with support from your, um, your tech people at your university. Send out the video and don't waste your time just talking at them when you have an online class but rather have them do the work ahead of time. And then you spend the time doing your problem-based learning, letting them ask questions, you asking them questions. So it's much more interactive. Can you do some mini lectures as well? Of course, you can have blocks of content, but I suggest that you intersperse that with the interaction. Let me tell you some research that I did uh, with Randy Garrison. Now, um, let's see, about 11 years ago. And what we did at that time, we still had a, not, a lot of novice learners moving into the online environment. And uh, through some pretty extensive um, interviewing and surveying of them, we identified five areas where the students were adjusting. So I, I want to say this to you because while we know that you're moving into this environment and we want to tell you the things for you to do, they also are moving in. And we think that they're digital nati natives and they're tech savvy. This is not Facebook or Instagram or WeChat or any of those other snippets of activities they do in online environments. So what we found from the students is there were five areas where they had to adjust. One is they're going to have to learn, many of them are going to have to learn about the technology just as you are. So that in some ways has to be job one, that you and the students work together to become familiar with the technology. Because without that, it will trip you up and it will constantly intervene and then the technology gets to run the show. So how do you do that? Well, get some tech people to come and show you or spend some time uh, in the early days when you're working online to go through some of the things. Now, when I use Adobe Connect with my students and it's a new group, I still go through where, you, where the buttonology is, where do you click, how do you find things, how do you get a hold of me, and so on. So I strongly suggest that the students identified the technology as one of the areas where they had to adjust. And this was 11 years ago. There was a lot of technology out by then. They were still adjusting. Um, the, the second thing that they talked about was their, their identity as a student. 
So they ha in some ways have to take on another way of being. You will as well. How do you get past that? Well, for you to be explicit about that, to say, you know, we're all adjusting to this and you're gonna be a somewhat different person than here than you might be in person. How do we get past that? Well, let's have open, um, honest communication. Let's make this an informal environment. Here's where you raise your hand if you wanna say something. Here's where you type something in if you wanna get my attention so that they can use the technology to express themselves as a real person. Um, the, I'm just gonna grab my notes here. The other thing that they, they have to adjust to is this new role for the instructor. If you let them, they will be as passive as possible. But if you require some interaction and you ask them to be active learners and don't just tell them things, but ask them things as well. Um, that's a new role for them. And you can say to them, you know, this is gonna be a little bit different, but we're all gonna adjust. The interaction is the, the fourth thing that we identified. The students needed to adjust to that, but they were, no, and now I'm speaking in two, uh, about two places here. You can have synchronous online learning, just as what we're doing today. You can also have asynchronous, which is discussion-based, and you're in there responding to posts and so on. They're, they're gonna have to adjust to that interaction. You need to tell them you expect it. They should be interacting with each other and with you. So one of your main roles as an instructor is to facilitate their interaction with each other. Uh, the last thing um, that, that is a little different for them is the course design as well. Now it's a little different here because you are taking place-based in-person courses and putting them online. I strongly recommend that you don't just lecture. Use the interaction opportunities here. But you may also want to take another look at your other design features, like what's your assessment going to be like? Should it be different uh, based on, on what you have? Should the times that you meet be different than what you had uh, done before? Are they the readings, the, the way they use the material, should that be different? Because it is different in online environments. And, um, there's lots of things you can read. I can make some suggestions before we're finished here. And I'll stop there. Great. Go ahead, George. Uh, yeah, no, thanks very much. I think there's some terrific feedback. And I think the final question I'll just direct to you. And, and thank you also for, for uh, offering to share some of your resources. Uh, anything you can share that you know, we'll bring into the course for, for readings, uh, we've already got your Community of Inquiry site that you uh, have set up uh, featured. And we're really mm -hmm. going to promote, because one of the things we want is for, for teachers to realize that there is a research-informed sort of framework that you can quickly adopt. And Community of Inquiry 1 is, is a nice one to get started started because it covers off some of the key practices and you can make good progress on it without uh, devoting a lot of time to getting up to speed on literature. It gives you a tool to think with about the online space. Now, as you, for people who decide to go further down that research pipeline, th there, there's a range of other theories and perspectives on how to teach online that they can you know, develop over time. But for now, the, the one that has significant research outcome that has uh, experienced a lot of attention from academics is the community of inquiry model. So a uh, final question I'd like to throw your way is uh, one of the big things, th there's a lot of stress involved here. There's stress for students, there's stress for teachers, uh, there's uncertainty, meaning you're teaching a course online as a faculty member, but you may be worrying about your partner or your parents or uh, students that, that are, are at risk. You might have colleagues that are uh, ill, you might have all kinds of challenges that are, that are, are rising. Could you comment at all about sort of that culture of care or that mindset of care that needs to exist in this environment as well and how you might be able to do that? So there's a new role for faculty in this and um, that, that perhaps is one of the most significant adjustments. So I think to George's point, you are coming into this in a very unique and highly intense and stressful environment. So I, 
I'm, I'm going to say again, with something that's central to the community of inquiry model, be present as a real person. And it's okay to say to your students um, um, and to your colleagues that there, there are other things that are somewhat distracting. How can we use the environment to support that? Well, you can, um, you, we're all gonna be, perhaps, uh, most of us are gonna be spending a lot more time um, in at quiet spaces, if you will, because we aren't going out as much and we aren't traveling as much. You can move some of what you might normally do in a lecture space into something that's just a video for them or add some more reading, um, give them some other things to do rather than having you in the lecture. That would be uh, some time saving. The other thing I have to recommend is the whole uh, movement around mindfulness in learning and mindfulness in the social environment. Certainly, um, you know, I, 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 there isn't possibly time here for, you, for me to list to you all the stressors in my life at the moment. However, I have a meditation practice that has to do um, not so much with any long hair beaded kind of robed people in my life, but my my commitment to my thinking and my brain. And that is that there has to be times for you where you do take a moment to de-stress, take a walk outside and so on. So um, in perhaps an all too maternal way, I'll say, uh, as you go through this, do take exemplary care of yourself, take breaks, maybe lighten that lecture load a little bit and offer other kinds of activities so that you can take good care of yourself and come into this with passion. Uh, you know, one of the things I wrote down to say to everyone today is embrace the technology. You know, it, it is, it can be daunting. It seems like something so foreign and strange. Um, and there has been a lot of resistance to it for this moment in time, at least. It doesn't have to be forever. Embrace the technology, get to know it, play with it. We're gonna have to do it, so use it, um, use it for the fun and for the opportunities that it offers. There are affordan affordances in this that will be valuable. So see it as not another stress that's uh, just because it's new, but perhaps something that maybe offers some relief once you get to know how to use it. Great, well, I think there, we'll share much of your work uh, on uh, through, through in the course as well. So uh, we'll, we'll certainly, listeners will get a chance to get a, exposed to your thinking and the work that you've already done. Uh, very much appreciate the research practitioner focus that you bring to the conversation, Marty, and uh, appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you, George. Good luck, everyone. <laughs>